Welcome to the Ag Emerge Podcast, brought to you by Ag Solutions Network. Your farming challenges are unique, so your practices should be too. We're here to share emerging ideas, build connections, and provoke conversation. Get ready to improve your soil, your crops, your livestock, and your family's livelihood. I'm your producer, Kim Chase. And I'm your host, Monty Bottens. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for joining us. Today, we welcome John Strasser, a research scientist in the Department of Agronomy at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. John works with colleagues on the Grassland 2.0 project, where they explore what an agroecological transformation would look like in the Midwestern United States. In today's conversation, Monty and John talk about those transformations and also about how it's as much a head game as it is a management game. So let's jump right in. Welcome, everyone, to this episode of the Ag Emerge podcast. I'm pleased to be joined by John Strausser from University of Wisconsin. I like to say the little extra Wisconsin in there. <laughs> I apologize for that. Uh, our neighbors to the north, and, and John is a, a former Illinoisan, and mm-hmm. he, he has moved north uh, to, to the land of uh, more sanity, we'll say, up there. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, welcome, John. Yeah, I appreciate you guys having me and uh, looking forward to it. And uh, I'm glad we were able to follow up on our conversation we had at Grassworks. You bet. I was just going to say that. I met John at Grassworks, uh, which is a regional grass-fed producer meeting. And um, it's always good to, you know, being primarily a corn soybean grower, I, I like to go to conferences that are outside of my comfort zone, you know, on on animal management or technology, those kind of things. Someone made that suggestion to me a while ago about go to a conference you've never been to before. So um, you learn things and and John was there and he, he did a great presentation, um, but I'm, I'm not going to steal your thunder. So introduce yourself, um, who you are, where you're from and and what what your story is and, and what you're working on. Yeah. So I was, uh, I was kind of thinking about this when I saw the prompt. So I, I kind of feel like uh, I'm like a fish returning to its natal stream. So I was a uh, I was born in Madison, Wisconsin, uh, in 1995, and then moved down to Memphis, Tennessee, and I've slowly crept my way back up the Mississippi River. Um, and so uh, I went, I think my journey into ag, so I, I didn't grow up in an agriculture background. My dad's actually a, a college professor, and my mom uh, runs a small business. And I um, did my bachelor's at Purdue University, and uh, my focus was in communications, and I was pretty dead set on going into a career of either athletic administration or running pro sports teams. I uh, played football at Purdue and kind of had an off-putting experience doing that and kind of needed, I knew I needed to do, have a career shift at some point in that equation, which I think is probably pretty typical for a lot of undergraduate students. And I took a class and the reason why I took it was because it didn't conflict with my spring ball schedule called Geosciences and Cinema. And the reason why it didn't conflict was the lab was essentially watching movies on Netflix. So it was kind of a classic um, dumb jocks class, you know, Uh, uh, underwater (laughs) basket weaving or 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 something Um, like that. I got you. (laughs) Yeah. But the professor was fabulous and it hit me. So I I always grew up to kind of hunting and fishing, doing stuff outside. Uh, My mom growing up had to put like a curfew on us so we didn't get like noise complaints from the neighbors. So I always liked being outside. But I just never had an inclination for the natural sciences. Um, and we were hearing a lecture on global climate change and all these things. And I'm like, holy cow, like, why are humans not more freaked out? Like, I don't think we're adequately scared of how bad this could be. Um, and so I kind of like an idiot went up to the professor and was like, does anyone study humans in the environment? Like, I literally thought I invented a field of study that no one had ever thought of. And he's like, yeah, there's professors that do that at Purdue. And I was like, well, that's what I'm going to do then. So I called my parents immediately after that. And it turned out as fate had it, my dad was flying to Taiwan. Uh, My dad's a visiting professor over there. And it happened to be the person sitting next to him on the flight was ended up being my faculty advisor. (laughs) Um, And he studies interactions, studies the concept of place, which is the interaction between humanity and biophysical landscapes. And so I got into that and I've been really captivated by Midwestern landscapes. Um, it's kind of where I grew up. 
uh, kind of where I had my experiences. And I feel like we have a lot of challenges on a Midwestern landscapes that are worthwhile addressing. So I've really focused on that. I've done work in urbanized areas like Chicago, which has been a lot of fun. Uh, and then I've kind of slowly crept out to the rural urban fringe. And now I've done a lot of work in agricultural land, which has really kind of become my passion to explore the social processes that underpin biophysical land shape change. And when we think about improving soil health or water quality or farmer quality of life, a big element of that is changing the biophysical landscape. And so how do you do that? And that's kind of been the focus of my study. The Ag Emerge podcast is brought to you by Ag Solutions Network. The ASN team is hands-on, digging in and invested in regenerative agriculture. Along with the proper plant nutrition and biologicals to boost your soil microbiome, we provide the ideas and implementation guidance to support you on your soil health journey. So stop farming the same way and contact Ag Solutions Network today at asn.farm. So I think it's kind of interesting. I got to insert this little joke here, a, a jab at Chicago, but, uh, you know, it started as a swamp and it still is a swamp in a different way. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, uh, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, yeah. a lot of, a lot of stuff comes, comes out of Chicago. So, <laughs> um, yeah. so that's interesting studying the place and, and uh, humans in landscape. I mean, wow. What a, what a 180 you have been through right? Yeah. Who was yeah. that professor? We got to, uh, got to nail uh, him or her down and say, Hey, yeah. You're, Andy, you're Andy changing Free. Lives. yeah. Yeah. And I have reached out to him and a lot of people think my dad influenced me to go into academia, but really when my dad passed me off, I made two promises to myself. And one was to not, I didn't want to go to grad school and become a professor. And the other promise was I never wanted to move back to Champaign-Urbana. Um, and three and a half years later, I was going to grad school at the U of I in Champaign-Urbana. So I was like, <laughs> Never say never. <laughs> yeah. So uh, uh, just remember, if you've said any other things like that, you're you're bound to be doing them <laughs> soon. Okay. <laughs> so that's that's interesting. So you know, you you talked about uh, uh, this class was uh, hey, we're gonna watch some movies and those kind of things. I would bet that there was some some uh, various uh, movies, documentaries that you did view that kind of prepped you for for making a change. Uh, what are some of those that you remember that were pretty impactful that might be good for, for others to watch or, um, you know, as a part of, of their learning experience? Yeah. You know, so the, the way that class worked was kind of interesting. Um, and I think this is, I think one thing we should be thinking about when we think about our, our agricultural landscapes is uh, a lot of these movies were movies that were uh, uh, fiction movies and, really did a good job of portraying like how popular culture saw environmental issues and things like that. Um, and so how narratives get created in popular culture then inform the way people come to understand systems. And so a lot of times when we think about our systems, like agricultural systems and stuff, uh, we, we sometimes think of it being like rooted in some set of objective facts that everyone agrees upon. But really a lot of times how we make sense of our biophysical landscapes are really based off popular culture or narratives that are uh, created to uh, benefit certain social outcomes. And so I think that is the thing I would really maybe th throw to your, your listeners is how, how is the story being created in relation to how we make sense of these landscapes? And so agriculture is just ripe with those, uh, all these stories that justify our land use, whether it be feeding the world or, uh, supporting the farmers or um, economic profitability, um, all these just storylines that people have out there. I'm, I know I'm missing some. Um, and even labels we put around agriculture, oh, this is regenerative agriculture. This is conventional agriculture. This is X, Y, and Z, organic agriculture. Um, we, those aren't, those are labels that are assigned social meaning. And so uh, that's something I would encourage people to think about as they kind of engage with these systems, that these aren't just innate facts that just are static objects out there. So let's dive into that a little bit. Uh, <laughs> um, <clears throat> one of my favorite quotes, and typically when I'm put on the spot, I, uh, or put myself on the spot, I mess it up, but uh, it, it goes something like, uh, it wasn't the things that I knew um, that were so, it was the things that I, I knew for sure that just were not. Uh, mm -hmm. 
So, see, I already butchered it. Uh, well, <laughs> Kim will clean yeah. it up in the show notes. Or <laughs> she'll uh, she'll go over top and my lips will be moving but not saying anything and she'll get yeah. married. But, uh, no, it's the things we know for sure that are not so that, that really do us in. And so that's a business of paradigms, right? So yeah. that's really the purpose of the podcast mm-hmm. is to help to uh, shape and mold the mm-hmm. ag paradigm to be yep. one of instead of conventional to one of uh, more regenerative and, mm-hmm. and regenerative not from a label standpoint but from a uh, purpose standpoint so yeah. something and, and, that we're doing today makes tomorrow better instead yeah. of something that we're doing today keeps us doing what we're doing which is sustainable mm-hmm. or what most people call sustainable is doing what we're doing today that will make it harder to do what we're doing tomorrow right and i think we should start out Monty, by just teasing out this word conventional, I was working on a manuscript. And I think this is what I talked about at Grassworks that I think got your attention. And mm-hmm. um, conventional, it's it's rather ironic to me that we call corn and soybean agriculture for the most part, or confined animal feeding conventional. When you think about uh, a state like Illinois, which is overwhelmingly in corn and soybeans. But if you look at the history of uh, time, that really was a grassland. And so the idea that we have, that a monoculture row crop is considered conventional in that biome, um, I think it makes it glaringly apparent how that is an idea that's been constructed by us as a society. Uh, and what hit me about it, I was teaching uh, at U of I and my, during my PhD, I asked my students, I said, what was here before corn and beans? And um, I had one student be able to tell me it was a tall grass prairie. One really? out of 150. So what, what did the others think it was? They just were kind of dumbfounded, like never thought about like what was here before corn and beans. I mean, and you you drive around and these were a lot of students who were like gen ed students, engineers, I mean, but the smart, smart kids. Um, and so it shows the power of those paradigms and that those social constructs of it makes it almost unquestionable. It just becomes it is what it is. Um and and I think part of what I try to disrupt in my research is it isn't just is what it is. It, like well, these are systems we put in place, and if we're displeased with the systems, then maybe as we as a society should engage in a dialogue about what is it we want out of these systems. Do we want it a state like Illinois uh, to pretty much entirely be in corn and beans and very large farms and um, some of the con- there's some benefits and consequences of that, or do we want something different? Um, and so I think a lot of times we think conventional is just a static object. And I think part of what I want to try to um, tease out is it's not a static object. It's something we've we've designed. And if we, we don't like it, we should redesign what it means. Yeah, because conventional's changed over time, right? So absolutely you know, con- conventional at when let's say when GMO was introduced. Well, GMO wasn't conventional. You know, that was that was on the fringe. Well, now Correct. GMO is conventional. And so uh, it is. It is not static. You're right. So, what is a better term? You think uh, the majority practice or the, uh, um, you know, today's majority practice? Uh, you know, so, I change my terminology to help uh, emphasize that. You know, as I'm. Talking I was just talking people. to a, a, a professor at Iowa State, a rural sociologist by the name of Katie Densman, about this, and and we were kind of debating it. Uh, my my gut at this point is just call it what it is. Like if it's corn and soybean, just call it like you're growing corn, you're growing soybeans, you're doing confined animal feeding. Like that is what the practice is. Now, I think sometimes it's helpful to be able to create these clusters or use these um, um, like heuristics to lump things together. Um, I think so. I think there could be some merit for that. But I think conventional as a word implies a normative um, element to it. It implies a normalcy to it. And so I think it's a particularly dangerous word to really assess to any type of agricultural practice, especially agricultural practices, if we're being frank, that are associated with loss of biodiversity, loss of soil health, um, uh, poor community outcomes, things that I don't think a lot of people are overarching fans of. Um, So... Yeah, so I, I think, can't say yeah. until uh, uh, grass fed is the conventional practice. I can't use that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> if that becomes the case, then I'll uh, be you'll let, it, you'll let it slide. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, out of a job. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, yeah, this sense of place and humans and their impact on the landscape. Um, 
you know, something that, uh, so this mm-hmm. is kind of an off the wall story and maybe I should save it for our after, okay. after, um, uh, discussion here, but so getting older, you know, it's time for the, the whole bifocals thing. Right. So <laughs> I figure, uh, what do I do? I wear contacts and, and bifocal contacts just aren't, you know, an option with, with my level of blindness. So <laughs> I, uh, I get some amazing contacts that just allow me to, you know, count the feathers on an eagle about two yeah. miles away. You know, it's awesome. Yeah. But boy, if, I, if I'm here, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm reading about this far and have to put readers on. Um, but what I noticed was, is because I had better focus on distance, I started looking further as I'm driving mm-hmm. down the road. And I look out over a landscape now, two, five, 10 miles. And I just, I see how that, interacts together with the 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 farming the roads the uh, pastures trees and it gives you a, a different per, um, perspective and and I'm always thinking about how what was this like before agriculture and, and how would herds roam how would natives hunt them those kind of things just to to see why do we have timber soil here versus prairie soil here? Why was, why did that happen because of the slope and location mm-hmm. and such? Yeah. Um, but there uh, is a significant impact of, yeah, the physical portion of that soil and humans interaction with that pre uh, European settlement and, and also post European settlement. Right. Right. Dramatic. The impact that we've had on, on the land. Mm -hmm. yeah and the practices that we engage in aren't what what i think's um fascinating from a from a human geography perspective which is kind of where my background ultimately lies around place research um the the upper midwest is a rather bizarre landscape because you have all these privately controlled properties but they're all i mean i think every farmer is going to tell me they manage to farm differently but I don't know. If you get on I-57 in Illinois, I see a whole heck of a lot of corn and I see a whole heck of a lot of soybeans. So I don't see overarching that much difference. I mean, I'm sure someone does, you know. Well, I mean, one does. person runs a green tractor and the other person runs a red. Red, red that tractor, is, right. That is. A, they write songs green about green. their green and red tractors. That's and how they're true. Different. See, there's part of the normal so- social construct <laughs> right there. <laughs> and to me, that's a fascinating thing because we often portray in the social sciences, especially we've thought about farm adoption and portraying farmers as these individual private landowners. And I always kind of scratch my head at that. I'm like, well, you know, what if everyone decided to get dressed in the morning and we all walked out of our house and we all decided to wear the exact same blue shirt? Like you would be like, well, that's kind of bizarre. (laughs) Um, And to me, it's like, isn't it kind of bizarre that everyone arrived at the decision to grow corn and beans. I mean, I know there's some people who grow something other than corn and beans, but a vast majority, I think 70% of the state of Illinois is in corn and beans. Wisconsin's probably on a similar number. I mean, it dominates the landscape. And so people people would look at you, John, and say, no, it's bizarre that you'd ask a question like that. Yeah. This is what we do. Well, this is, I guess, the benefit I had of growing up in a college town and not being a farm kid. It's just like, this is a weird landscape, honestly, where I think if you grew up on a farm, you'd probably be like, that's the way it is. You grow corn and beans. So yeah 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 it, it, it's fascinating the things that we just assume and, and, and take for granted and mm-hmm. yet we all as farmers think we're doing things so much differently than each other but at the end of the day you're right we're just growing corn and beans or we're just another tomato grower or almond grower i mean it's not not that different you know right right huh. exactly and if we want things like biodiversity or water quality should we be thinking about different like and open ourselves up to that opportunity don't go there i mean (laughs) geez Uh, okay so everybody uh uh open up the aspirin uh caplets and 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 pop a few i think we're going to get a little little, i know that might be anxiety going here so let's talk about that what does how does that change when changing the landscape changing the outcomes uh dive into that what you're i you're just starting to say yeah i think you know well first off it's not easy and there's so many things you run into. It's just, it's, it's mind numbing. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the one thing I can say emphatically is it has to be a collective action. I was reading some of the prompt questions you gave ahead of time. And, you know, it was like, you know, what would you, what would you do? What, and, and I really think we as a whole need to get away from our individual framing 
and and start thinking about how do we work together and so for instance in the in this in the in a lot of the adoption social science literature we've been focused a lot of the focus has been on these psychological so working at an individual scale essentially how can i message something to a farmer to convince them to change their practice and i i think we need to maybe get away from that framing and think more about how do we work with communities to shape a context in which we want we get outcomes in which we want and so Kind of what we've been asking farmers to do of late, I've been using this example. Um, if you think about like a very fancy hotel ballroom and maybe like Wrigley Field or some ball ballpark, what we've been kind of asking farmers to do from a behavioral perspective, if you if you want to guess step in my world a little bit, um, has been asking farmers to act like they're in the hotel ballroom, but put them in Wrigley Field. Okay, well, it's not that you've changed fundamentally as a person, you just changed the setting or the context in which you're in. So in the hotel ballroom, you might put on a suit and a tie and and drink maybe a fancy foo-foo like martini or something. But at Wrigley Field, you're probably going to put on a ball cap, maybe get a bag of peanuts and, you know, cheap light beer and maybe, you know, yell at the guy next to you for being a Cubs fan because he really should be cheering for the Cardinals. (laughs) Um, Uh, I I was was wanting to get that in there somehow, but thank you for doing it. (laughs) And so it's not that I fundamentally changed as a person. I just changed the context. And so... I think if we really want to change farmer behavior or change behavior beyond just farmers, I think this goes to the community scale. We really should be thinking about how do we design a context collectively? So this is about working with together with people, not working at people, working with people to create a system that gets the outcomes we want. So I think to do that, you have to have a collective dialogue about what it is we want. And that, so that, that's a, painfully slow process and that's been a big part of what we've been trying to do at this grassland 2.0 project at uw madison is going out into communities and asking all sorts of people doctors in rural communities um small business owners farmers uh crop advisors uh meat processors anyone and everyone who's willing to talk to us pretty much about like what do you want your future to be what do you what are things you're concerned about what are things that you see as opportunities okay if that's where we want to go and we've been calling this like a a story of the future, what would the pathways we would need to get and how could we kind of lock arms and, and pull weight in that direction? And I think that really needs to be part of this regenerative movement is a very deliberate thought about where we want to go and then how we as a society could construct a context that allows that to come in, makes it easy to come into existence. Because right now it often feels like an uphill kind of slog. Um, and how, well, do you, how do you get away from that? The reality, we've designed a context that's easy to be in today. Right. Right. So the the, the context that we're in, um, the don't say that word conventional, uh, mm-hmm. that we're currently doing is um, that's a, that's the social construct, right? So right. The, the tax dollars of, of the community is supporting farming in that way. Yeah. And it's not supporting farming in a different way. Yeah. And let's let's break down conventional, right? And who is it benefiting? Um, You know, so I got into this kind of a naive city kid, right? And I'm like, I grew up swimming in the Great Lakes, going to Mississippi River. And I'm like, all right, well, I see all the water getting polluted and stuff. And I'm going to go up and talk to these farmers and figure out why the heck they do that. And what I've learned kind of talking to them is they don't really like it either. (laughs) And so really raised the question to me is like who's enjoying this system um and i'm sure there's some farmers who like it but i mean a lot of the farmers i've talked to have been like oh yeah i mean i wish i didn't have to you know it'd be easier to milk in 2000 cows milking 400 cows it's like well that actually makes sense would be easier than harvesting a bunch of feed and and storing it oh if i could just put my cows out on pasture that'd be easier it's like so wait like you want to do it differently we as a society would benefit from things being done differently so it's like raises a question of like, why are we doing this? Like, this doesn't make sense. <laughs> um, like, it doesn't seem like anyone's winning from it. That's what's, I guess, sometimes I wake up at night and just get frustrated. I'm like, who's who's winning here? Um, um, and I think there's probably some some names we could probably think of people maybe who are winning, but <laughs> I don't know if collective society is winning. <laughs> right. And, and what does it take to uh, for a person to reach that point and ask that question? Really? I, I a tough question yeah. asked because there isn't an answer. There isn't a right. clear cut answer. And there isn't a clear cut we answer. probably don't like 
the answers we're going to hear. Yeah, exactly. And I think one thing too, I always try to tune into when I do interviews. I mean, because when I come out and meet farmers and talk kind of the way I'm talking right now, it could be very threatening to your identity. I mean, if you you hang your hat on being a corn and bean farmer and and that's your identity, I mean, a lot of people hang their hat on what their occupation is and that gives them a lot of self-worth. And that is very, I, I'm a fan of that. Like, that's a good thing. And so sometimes like when I talk, it can come off as very threatening because uh, it could seem as an attack on a, an identity. And that's not the intent. Uh, the intent is to say, um, you know, how does that, how should that identity evolve so that y- you keep serving society in a, in a meaningful way, which I think fundamentally underlies what farmers really care about uh, more so than growing corn and beans. I think they ultimately want to care for their property, their communities uh, and, and feed people. And so um, not necessarily grow corn and beans. Um, you know, if growing corn and beans is part of that equation, then so be it. But I think underlying that identity is more, more so. And I, and I had a good talk with a PhD student I had been advising yesterday and she, her dad farms in Iowa, Western Iowa. And she said, I felt this dissonance with my dad his whole life because he has these values of taking care of soil and taking care of his community and things like that. And, but he also wants to be known as a good farmer, a farmer that grows nice straight rows of corn, even land, things like that. And it, those things he has felt don't mesh all the time. There's an incongruence and that dissonance, it seems is quite taxing on farmers. Um, and I think we, I think we can do better than that. So I, I hope to work with people to, to kind of create that, that synergy. So how do we do it? <laughs> I think I think it's a painful uh slow process and I think it's I think w- that's kind of what we're piloting in this project in this process we call collaborative landscape design and as I said I think you have to get an idea of where things where you want things to go in the future and where those bottlenecks are so one like clear thing to me is around like supply chains how do you get supply chains that essentially supply chains are a big part of a context right um you know, if you grow something, you need to be able to sell something to a marketplace. So, you know, if we're going to have people raise grass fed beef or something like that, then they got to have processing that rewards their effort on that. I mean, going and dropping your beef off the cargo, they're not going to give you the premium price you probably deserve. Um, where if you have local processing and things like that, uh, but those all take time to get put in place. So I, I don't think the big solution is an overnight fix. I don't think we can wake up tomorrow and be like, all right, we've got a regenerative system in place. But, you know, the best way to, to, what do they say? The best way to eat an elephant is one bite at a time. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of, it is kind of that. And I think one of the challenges I've seen in my job is acting, uh, frenetically and working quick but also reminding people like even if we're working as fast as possible like this is a long thing and so sometimes people feel a level i've felt this from communities i work with like impatience of like what are we doing like we're going nowhere and it's like this is gonna like you gotta be patient it's gonna take time just believe in the process um and i think also one of the other things that we need to try to avoid uh, we've done a really good job as a society siloing ourselves. And I think we got to, I've been talking to some farmers up in Marathon County, Wisconsin. And uh, in Wisconsin, we have this big kind of dynamic of like, oh, that's a Madison person. Oh, that's like rural Wisconsin person. And we were like, that's just not el- helpful because like, do Madison people and rural Wisconsin people really hate each other? And it's like, the more we interact, it's like, no, we kind of don't. So like, why do we, us being at um, odds with each other or in each other's grill about things isn't really helpful to the overarching goal of what we're trying to do. And so I think honestly having candid assessments about that and kind of breaking down those silos and creating a more of that collective we of how we're going to go is a bit got to be a big part of how we do it. And I, I know that might not be a very gratifying answer to your listeners because it'd be a heck of a lot easier if it was like, all right, well, step one to the plan is do this. Step two, do this. Step three, do this. And then we'll get there. Uh, I I just don't think we're going to have that type of a plan, which is unfortunate because if it was a step-by-step process, man, it would be, we would have done it by now. (laughs) 
Well, I, I still think there's some individual things that can be done, you know, um, yeah. as a farmer, you can, you can make a change. I, I think everybody should make a change towards, uh, uh, implementing more of, uh, soil mm-hmm. health principles, a different one or, or dive deeper every year. Yeah. Right. Uh, and I'm saying it's you, you, can, you, can control change. you, but yeah. you know, and then you can influence, uh, others by opening up your farm sharing Mm -hmm. sharing your story and and those kind of things to to others and kind of build that hey it's okay to do some of this stuff you know and you know and what's something like though this like this podcast doing money we're normalizing those individual behavior we're normalizing oh you you know what it's cool do something different like that's fine you're not gonna no one's gonna arrest you for that (laughs) if you want to try some new practice on your farm and so it's in part, yeah, it ultimately ends up to an individual level behavior, but there's, and I think this has really been a big thing that's occurred over the seven years I've been working on. There's been more talk about it. So I think it's starting to normalize. And, and I think social media, so you look at conferences used to be the way that, you know, mm-hmm. you'd go to the national no-till conference 10, 12 years ago, and it'd be home old homeschool week. And uh, it'd be people you hadn't seen for a year, hadn't talked to them, and you all catch up and those kind of things. Well, social media comes along, and you see what they're doing every day, and you're part of groups of of mutual interest. And now I think that community isn't necessarily, you know, fence line to fence line. I I think that community is a um, more Mm -hmm. of a, a virtual geospatially, but Mm -hmm. um, more like minded. Uh, yeah. in, in approach uh, so I think that's that's helping the adoption and then the other thing is too as I think as each one of those people within that community do things neighbors see and they start trying some things mm-hmm. yeah this is something I've been writing about is uh, around social spatial scales which is a really fancy way of saying what you just said of your farm isn't just uh, isolated you can you I can't tell you how many farmers are interviewed. Like, why did you do that practice? Well, I was watching a YouTube video and Gabe Brown was talking about this. And, you know, when I started, I'm like, well, who the heck's Gabe Brown? <laughs> uh, and, and then you had to look up the Godfather. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's, and you know, there's Ray Archuleta and all these people, people oh, watching yeah. YouTube videos of all this stuff. And yeah. So from a social science perspective, that's really interesting because those are social processes that are spanning social spatial scales, which is really fancy way of saying someone's doing something way over here and it's impacting what someone's doing way over here. That's kind of an interesting thing. Not just like someone just rolled out of bed and said, well, I independently arrived at this uh, decision. Um, And so that's one of the ideas too, around our grass and 2.0 learning hubs is that, you know, we'd have a group maybe over in the driftless area of Wisconsin and they would bump into a group over here, maybe in north central Wisconsin, be like, hey, have you guys tried this? That could work. Um, and kind of that cross pollination. So I think it's been a big, big thing. And social media has changed. Yeah, the way knowledge is transferred big time. So let's, uh, okay, let's turn up the headache factor a little bit here. Um, so let's say that, yeah, it's great. We're seeing what Gabe's doing and and we apply it to other places or, or other people and we're applying other cases, but let's let's just say for the sake of argument here we're just doing some incremental changes we're mm-hmm. not doing big we're still growing corn we're still growing wheat cotton we're just doing it differently right so now let's talk about uh, uh pulling the cord and uh, jumping out, jumping out of the airplane and looking at reverting from an annual crop basis back to a perennial landscape and i've been given a lot of thought to this lately what would that look like how would i do it you know mm-hmm. having uh uh, tree tree fruit or nut crops that we can harvest intergrazing uh, possibly annuals uh, all you know and looking at cluster approaches and you know vertical height dynamics and just lots of things bounce around up inside this this uh, between these headphones and I I think that uh, there is a tremendous opportunity to just rethink completely how we do uh, food production instead of, well, we'll call it agriculture, but, uh, food production. So you, you've, uh, you've thrown those ideas out there, take, take it away and, and, uh, give us some headaches to think about. <laughs> yeah. So a couple of things come to mind. So I think if someone's looking at a transition like that, what you talk about, there's a lot of the technical elements, which 
farmers absolutely need to be on their A game to feel comfortable with that. I mean, I always had anxiety about that uh, with our project because we are talking about a transformation to a perennial system. And one thing I've always try to be thoughtful about is like if I told someone to shift the way they farm and then it doesn't work and then something bad happens like they you know they try a new system and then they go bankrupt and lose their farm or something like that that would be like the worst feeling in the world so um you want to make sure if someone's making a transition that they feel very confident in all the information they got and feel comfortable with yeah we're going to do this and this is why we're going to do this and we're going to do this here because this is why it makes sense to do it here and and so that i think is a very very important element of that and i think so that comes from like the technical crop advising agriculture advising element of things i think the other thing that has to occur for that transformation to happen is we have to normalize these practices occurring in certain landscapes so I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've talked to farmers and be like, oh, well, that's good pasture land because it's, you know, a degrade slope and it's like goes down to a bog. So it's, it's like you can't only get else there. So yeah, <laughs> it's like you can either put it in CRP or you can graze it. <laughs> um, so you're a good farmer because you're at least getting something out of nothing. Um, and, you know, if someone put pasture on flat black dirt, they'd be like, why are they putting pasture on corn land? Yeah. And it's like, why is that corn land is something someone like me would say, why can't that be pasture land? Uh, or why can't it be pick your, pick your, pick your poison, so to speak. Um, and so I think there's the need to be this process of socially normalizing. And I think, um, you know, if someone like you were to adopt pasture on flat black dirt, you know, your neighbors would drive by. And so uh, this is actually kind of a funny story. This under, underlined my dissertation work. I was duck hunting in Monroe, Wisconsin. We were driving over to South Wayne, which is on Highway 11, if anyone's from that area of Wisconsin. And uh, I was sitting in the back half asleep. You know how it is, duck hunting. You're up at like 4.30 in the morning, and you're like, why the heck are we doing this? <laughs> we could spend our Saturday sleeping in. Instead, we're waking up at 4.30 a.m. to shoot, you know, like one-pound ducks. Um, and then you get to the blind, and you're like, oh, yeah, this is why we do it. <laughs> um, but I was sitting in the back of a pickup truck, like we had pickup eyes in the back and then the front were two farmers and they were just like oh yeah jim's field like you know corn looks rough this year this and that and as a human geographer i'm really fascinated when people ascribe meaning to landscapes and so that's what they were doing the whole entire drive and so you know how it is duck hunting you can have that chit chat time and i was like what are you what were you guys doing on the way here and the guy goes oh we were just road farming and i'm like there you go that's a paper right there <laughs> um and so if someone put pasture on flat black dirt, someone's going to go by and road farm and be like, hmm, Monty's been doing that for a handful of years. His farm seems to be doing pretty good. And he seems to be having pretty good soil health. And when I drive by the creek, by his house, it looks clean. It doesn't look like it's a brown manure legume. That's interesting. Uh, something must be working there. And so I think there's a lot of people reading landscapes going on and right now if you read the landscape you read a lot of if it's flat and black it should be in corn and beans and so i think it's going to take some people to kind of what we would call in place literature discursive place making disrupting what is for for a new like what ought to be a new system uh and that's that's not easy and i think we need to try to support people as they go through that and that's i think we're technical service providers and forums like this help support people Make them not feel, you know, some, hopefully someone listens to this podcast and decides, you know, what, I'm going to put a pasture on my flat land and then they're going to listen to it and be like, you know, what, I'm not nuts. Like this makes sense. <laughs> um, and so, um, you know, I think that's a big part of it. I don't know if I rambled or made sense there. <laughs> no, you, it made a lot of sense. And um, I would say in the, in the road farming context, John, uh, I'm, I'm not to the point of, Hmm, I should try that. Uh, I'm currently at the stage of, is he nuts with seven dollar corn? You know, so, <laughs> uh, you know that's that's where I'm at right now. So yeah, uh, you know, that, yeah. we still have another ten years or so to go before people are like, hmm, I wonder if I'd try that. So yeah. we'll, we'll see. And, and you know, the other thing is too is um, uh, when it is seven dollar corn, 
you, you know what, when that pasture went in, it wasn't $7 corn. Uh, that it was, it was designed for a two year rotation, you know, the, when it went in and on part of the plan, uh, things weren't too, too exciting. Right. And then one year changed happened and got very exciting. So, you know, you have to realize that, um, not every year makes you money in corn and soybeans. Not every year right. makes you money in, money in uh, pasture ground. So what's interesting about it, when you think about a context, mm -hmm. and I think about places being constructed in a context, and, and don't hold me to these numbers because I'm trying to remember off the top of my head, but I'm trying a chart I saw from, and it was based off USDA data. Corn and soybeans, I think, was, over the past 20 years, independently on its own has been profitable. I think it, the number was four times. And it was not profitable, the other 16. But what made farmers whole was the crop subsidies and the government support. Where pasture was profitable because it's not, you you know, you're not able to get the subs. I mean, there's the subsidies aren't as robust. Um, was profitable independently on itself. Um you obviously maybe can't home run hit as much as you can, so to speak, with with you on corn and beans. You know, when corn and bean prices are high, sure, you probably can make out like a bandit some years. But it really then, to me, calls into question, like, why are we actively supporting such a system at such a robust level if we want different systems? And this is why I think it goes beyond farmers into a broader societal question of, like, why are we taking taxpayer dollars to do that? And if we want to take taxpayer dollars to support food production, which maybe is not a bad idea, should we have a more robust conversation of like, what should that look like rather than just re-up the farm bill every four years or every so often, right? So. I don't have the answer for that. And, <laughs> I yeah. wish I had the answer to that. Maybe something other than Real just enigma, just right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um farming weird uh farming differently yeah uh, describe your ide ideal landscape for because at the end of the day we still have to make food right right um and um i wanted to die we'll dive into the feed the world thing in the after show but, uh, <laughs> um let's talk about we still have to um generate something for ourselves or to yeah. to sell off farm how does yeah. that how does that happen what does that look like in a perennial yeah. landscape so I've always been fascinated by the Midwest in part because it's going to be what I'm going to call a working landscape. We don't have a lot of protected land like they do in the West of like, this is a national park. Everyone put the fence up and like hold your arms around it and don't let anything in. Um, you Which know, has, of, that has its own problems too. I mean, right, there's not. Right. I'm, I, I'm, I'm a fan of, them. yeah, I'm a fan of, I don't, I'm, I like the Midwest landscape, <laughs> but that way. Because people live, work, go about their life on it, right? And I think we have to, if you think about meeting biodiversity goals and soil health goals, we have to find ways to have people, we are part of the system. You have to find ways to have humans live in the ecosystem and also not have the ecosystem function crater. Like part of the ecosystem function has to be humans are on it and the ecosystem can re remain functioning. And so uh, I think we need to think about how do you then configure farms to produce food? Because obviously we, we, we do like eating um, in a way. Some that more then, than others, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't think I'm overly slight either, Monty. <laughs> but uh, in a way that allows that. And I think, you know... I, I think we can produce a lot more calories per acre if we think about smaller farms. I mean, I was on a farm in North Central Minnesota where they were producing vegetables and I just couldn't help but think myself, they had one acre and they were producing for vegetables for numerous farmers markets, the food pantry in town. And I'm like, they're doing this on one acre. Like I I just can't imagine one acre of number two dent corn is producing that much caloric density, but that's gonna require a lot more farmers. And so- um, which I don't think is a bad thing either. Um, but then we got to think about how land will be. I mean, that's a, now I'm talking a pretty dramatic shift in the way we use our land. Um, I think the ideal farm, I've had people ask me about this because a lot of times the project named Grassland 2.0, a lot of people think it's just going to be exclusively perennials. Mm -hmm. And I kind of laugh at that because like right, right now it's pretty much exclusively annuals. So like what would it be if we had a little bit more? 
Uh, so let's say if you had a 150 acre Wisconsin farm, which is a touch smaller than the average size Wisconsin farm, but I think that's probably the size we should be thinking about. Um, you know, you'd maybe have a hundred or so in pastures, and then you'd have, you know, the other 50 in some sort of rotation of crops, whether it be corn, some type of vegetables, soybeans, um, you know, whatever, you know, I, I, I think, you know, each farmer might do something differently. I think more diverse rotations would be a big part of the annual systems that do remain. Like instead of it just being like a corn, corn, soy, or, you know, something like that, it's got to be more like, I know some of the practical farmer, Iowa folks are doing like eight year rotations and things like that. And they're having a lot of luck with that. So like, why wouldn't we do that on what ground does remain an annual? So to me, that is what egg would look like and if i had like the keys to the universe and could 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 to do it and i also think it would look like we'd have very robust rural communities we would you know you wouldn't go to the tavern on main street on a friday night and have crickets be there i mean it would be hopping uh you know friday night football games would be hopping again uh, not that they're gone away i mean i shouldn't say that <laughs> but you know i think I think there's room for growth there. And I think also one thing I would say is a better connection between our urban and our rural areas. You know, wh why wouldn't we have a farmer? Why wouldn't we have a person who lives in Madison, Wisconsin, know their farmer who maybe grows their beef over in, in Baraboo? Um, that would be helpful, in my opinion. Um, and so um, just better synergy as a society, too, is like from a social perspective, not just biophysically what the farm landscape looked like. Yeah, it's um, <clears throat> what you're describing is what we did 100 years ago, right? Yeah, more or less. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, it's and, and not that that's not that that's wrong. Right. So, you know, when I look at this, the five soil health principles, um, you know, I the, the, the fifth one of integrating livestock, I always thought that used to be the hardest to really do. Mm -hmm. Um. I currently have come to my, my thought pattern today is the, the diversity is mm -hmm. currently my hardest thing to do. I thought a high diversity cover crop, you know, check the box, whoop, done. And, uh, no, we're, we're still growing corn and soybeans, you know, looking at extended rotations, perennial grasses, those kind of things. Uh, and, and I would say just the, the more I've observed and, and done and that that is probably the, the most impactful thing we can do is improve diversity of the crops that we're growing. Is yeah. that what you've come to the conclusion of too? I think that's a big part of the equation. No doubt about it. I always joke. I work with an entomologist and I always tease him. I say, Claudio, do we still have people with PhD studying if you can have biodiversity in a monoculture row crop? <laughs> and I'm like, it's kind of an obvious conclusion. If you plant a whole field in one crop, you're not going to have much biodiversity because you've, created a monoculture you want no biodiversity is what you're we're spraying chemicals actively to not have biodiversity um so it's like i think i could probably get we wonder why we're going through the the largest <laughs> extinction event on right. exactly Earth. exactly how could that be? it's like i think i said like, oh, i think if i could get a kindergartner out there we're, to we're come feeding to the world we're feeding the world you know? right and so i think biodiversity the the rotations the if so if you have an annual, I think bigger rotations is a big part of it. I think if I think people should really be thinking about perennials just because you have if you have a perennial grass, you're gonna have more of a mix, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I think that has to be a big part of it. One thing that's funny on the five soil health principles, I don't know if funny is the right word. I was applying with some colleagues for an NRCS conservation innovation grant this fall. And so I'm a I'm a human geographer by training. So I like the soil stuff, like I'm like dangerous to know about it because i interact with a bunch of soil people but i don't really know what's going on and um i was reading the call and they like had four soil health principles they had omitted reintegrating livestock and i was like wait like i had like brain whiplash because i was just in a presentation where a soil scientist was telling me there's five of them and i'm like how did this one disappear yeah, and a big that was a big political argument yeah and, and someone I, was like well that one's difficult to uh, implement and the social scientist like alarm bells rang off in my head i was like oh this is oh this because is... it's difficult you shouldn't do it <laughs> right yeah and it, to me being someone who's like a social constructivist by paradigm i'm like oh we're not the idea of these are rooted in fact but one just magically disappeared it's like 
it's not really rooted in fact, it's rooted in our social context. And we said, oh yeah, that one's tough. So don't worry about that one. Um, <laughs> and yeah, it's, it's kind of like so, telling your spouse, oh, it's tough to stay faithful. So we just won't worry about that one. Yeah, <laughs> We'll just ignore that. that that's one. a principle <laughs> that matters, you know? So, it, uh, it, and I think, you know, from what I understand, that is one that really, really, I mean, I think biodiversity is probably one. And then two, I mean, they all matter. I mean, you got to do them all, in my opinion. Yeah. So. No, I'm just, you know, I'm trying to think of, because here you are, I'm I'm outside of the the local social context, right? So I'm, right. I'm trying to think, how do I increase that diversity? Because I don't have the marketing channels uh, for buckwheat, peas, um, you know, vine crops, um, you know, all those kind of things. I, I don't have the market for them. So that's what I'm kind of... Um, I think... Uh, I think- I think this is where our, this is where I think our land grant universities are and other bigger institutions are kind of failing us is we should be actively and this is what I'm hopeful about our project and I think what makes our project at UW Madison different is like farmers we need to develop those markets and farmer a farmer can't just say yeah I'm going to get peas and I'm going to develop a pea market there needs to be some level of organizing of like okay yeah Monty's going to grow peas the other farmer in Quad Cities is going to grow peas and there's another 10 farmers over here, they're going to grow peas and they're all going to sell peas to this person who needs peace. Like you have to coordinate action. Um, and to me, and land grant it, university should it, have a role in that coordinating. Right. And as you get it more efficient on the production of peas and right. processing of peas, now instead of uh, a farmer that wants to go to a soy free diet because their customers are asking for it, instead of it costing them 50% more to go to that, because now we have a, an efficient, to market strategy, it costs them ten percent more. Well, now all of a sudden, there's more demand, you know, for right. for that substitutionary. So, exactly. yeah, you know, and when so when I'm looking at that diversity element, it's uh, okay. Is this is this something we take on as an enterprise for the processing and the marketing and all those yeah. kind of things? So it, it there's a lot of barriers it, to that diversification. Yeah. So this is where I really want to emphasize the like collective rather than the individual because i think if it gets framed as an individual thing a farmer is going to be like yeah i should be doing that but this is overwhelming like i can't create a market on my own and i guess what i want to convey is like yeah you shouldn't ha- have to do that alone like we need to you, 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 these are things you can't do alone like you can't create a, a supply chain by yourself because it inherently requires multiple actors right it requires a consumer requires a processor requires the infrastructure with the truck and do all those important jobs in a food system. So these shifts can't be individual. They have to be collective because it requires multiple actors with multiple different expertise to, um, to carry them out in a fruitful manner. So, so I guess I want to make sure people realize that. So they don't, because I worry people could become disenchanted with, what we're talking about because they could be like oh yeah that makes a lot of sense and then feel like they can't do it and then they want to push back against it because they feel like that's something impossible to achieve and and but so i think if you can get enough people um and and mm-hmm. go together in, in a co-op style right exactly you know, the processing and marketing and, and move from there so there's ways to do it yeah. there's ways to do it a co-op style is a yeah i'm with you yeah all right well we're running running short on time here uh um, hour goes by else? quick I know, isn't it? Uh, anything else uh, we should sneak in the, this episode here before we before we part ways? You know, not 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 too much. I think I would encourage people to just we have our project Grassland 2.0 uh, UW Madison. Uh, I will say I was listening to some of your earlier podcast, and and I know from farmers there's been a um, kind of a disenchantment with the university system, and oh, here's another land grant PhD guy talking and. Uh, I had a kind of a big, uh, I don't know if a brouhaha is the right way to say it, but I had a kind of a, a chat with a farmer over in Southeast Wisconsin. And he's like, oh, you, all you university people are like this. And, and I kind of went back to him. I said, you know, I could turn around and say, all you farmers are like this, but it doesn't respect that. Like there are people trying to do things differently. And I just, I just want to say, I've been around a lot of campuses and stuff. And I think I really do believe like the faculty members and the graduate students and the people on our project, we really are trying to do things differently. Are we perfect? Heck no. But um, we think there's a better system out there that takes care of people in a better way. And I think 
when push comes to shove, that's what a lot of people care about. And so, um, yeah, well, I, I, uh, I'll take that advice. I, I've always thought there's a 2% factor, um, at, within the academia, there, there's yeah. two percent that are very taking us to the next level. I mean, they're the real innovative drivers and, and you're likely in, in that category of folks. And, and we thank you for what you're doing. I I'm particularly hard on the bureaucratic people. So the, uh, the uh, we've been, we've I, been I, I, to provide my some, glacial uh, speed thing. I, I, you know, we've got some glacial speed government I, back I, against us. <laughs> we've no, been trying you, to get some learning hub support out to our hubs and we yeah. like can't get the paperwork processed. And I'm like, these people literally make fun of us because we're a bureaucracy. And I'm like, we are living up to our stereotype right now. Can you stop making us look bad? <laughs> <laughs> no, I would encourage everyone to check out the Grassland 2.0 website. It's a it's a beautifully designed website, by the way. Um, and there's lots of good information on there. And take take a moment, uh, change your thinking, and and consider to do something different, right? And and get plugged yeah. in with people who will help you along the way, where technical or emotional support, <laughs> really. I mean, <laughs> yeah, like, it's okay, it's okay. You everybody thinks you're weird, but it's okay. Keep going. Yeah. And. Uh, uh, and check it out. So, no, yeah. John, uh, great points. Uh, I appreciate all that you're doing, and and uh, learning always is applied in a social context. And right. um, understanding that social context is is critical to getting. Uh, there's plenty of ideas that just oh, yeah. are not being implemented. So, yeah. you know, the key is yeah. getting them implemented. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you having me on, Monty, and I appreciate people listening, and, and I wish people the best as they go forward with their operations and things like that, and just hope we can be a small part of the solution. Uh, I really think, you know, a lot of different perspectives are needed, and a lot of different uh, people kind of rowing the boat in the same direction is, is what's needed, and so I just really want to say I appreciate everyone who's who's a part of that, um, part being part of the solution, so... I have a suspicion we're going to revisit again in a few years. <laughs> I sure hope so. <laughs> so. That is awesome. Thank you all for listening today. And thank you, John, for being here. This conversation today is a great igniter for new ideas and exploring what agroecological transformation could look like on some unlikely landscapes. And at Ag Solutions Network, we're in the business of helping growers transform their soils and practices. Want to learn more? Well, check out our website at asn.farm. And there you can click on links to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and YouTube. There's a lot of great things happening and always something to learn. Thanks for listening.